Uh, good morning, Thermo One class. Uh, this is uh, the last day of lecture, and I'm going to work through uh, some more of these uh, homework problems. Just talk through them. Perhaps it'll help. Uh, our exam is Monday, uh, December uh, 7th from 10.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And I will, it is in iLearn. Uh, you will have someplace between 10 and 15 problems. I think I've got seven or eight right now. <clears throat> and I intend, I'm, uh, I have more to add. So uh, expect 10 to 15 uh, calculation type problems. There might be one or two where you just select an, you know, like a typical multiple choice or true false, but I suspect most of them will be calculations. Okay, uh, so the next problem uh, to be talked through is problem 1033, and you see uh, the start of the solution on the screen here. Uh, a process requires a heat transfer rate of 3 million BTUs per hour uh, to be delivered at 170 degrees. It's proposed that a refrigerant R134A vapor compression heat pump be used to develop the process heat using weight, a waste heat uh, water stream at 125 degrees Fahrenheit as the lower temperature source. So uh, industrial heat pumps do get used in this sort of a fashion. Uh, the figure below we'll take a look at provides uh, data on this cycle operating at steady state. Uh, the compressor isentropic efficiency is 80%, and we're going to sketch on a TS diagram and determine all of the following. So we'll just run through those as we get to them in the solution. Um, okay, so here's our uh, <clears throat> diagram, and so we say that's pretty pretty typical heat pump. So we've got some wastewater stream down here at 125 uh, Fahrenheit. And so that's going to go into the evaporator. So the evaporator is going to have to be colder than 125 Fahrenheit for any uh, finite device. And that's going to provide uh, probably a superheated refrigerant. Sorry, it could be saturated, but uh, it's got to be vapor into the compressor. Uh, isotropic efficiency 80%. We're going to come out probably superheated and go into the condenser and the condenser is what is going to supply the heat to the process and so the process is at 170 so this uh, temperature inside the condenser is going to have to be hotter than 170 to make that heat transfer occur spontaneously. Uh, and so then we'll have saturated liquid or it could be subcooled, but we'll have liquid coming out of the condenser going through the expansion valve where we drop pressure. And then uh, a little bit of it flashes, uh, most of it's still liquid. And then it goes into the evaporator where it boils away at low temperature and pulls heat in, out of the wastewater. And so on and around and around we go, we're putting some work into the compressor. Uh, to make it operate. Okay, so here's um, some of the state point information given. State one into the compressor is 180 uh, psi a. Those will have to be absolute pressures because we're going to take them to the uh, tables. And the enthalpy is 116.74 at two. They don't tell you. They tell you the pressure. They don't tell you the temperature. The enthalpy. So they want you to determine that. That's part of the problem. Uh, three, we're uh, saturated liquid. I expect we can check these enthalpies here in a second. And then at four, uh, that's that throttling process <clears throat> uh, at constant enthalpy. And it's to the low pressure. Uh, let's see, do we have, uh, here's the uh, cycle diagram. So the compressor from one 
to two, and uh, it's not isentropic. So the isentropic compression is from one. I'm sorry, for the real compressor is from one to two s. Oh, that's that's backwards. <laughs> There's a few mistakes on this diagram. So this state right here, straight up, should be two s, and this state over here is two. So scratch that S and put it down there because <clears throat> this shows the increase in entropy. So that's what the real compressor does. Okay. And also note these temperatures are Fahrenheit, not Rankin. So whoever did this solution, I think they got the numbers right uh, as much as I've checked them, but some of the symbols are a little scrambled. Okay. But anyway, then the condenser goes from two, which is actually here all the way down to three, which is showing saturated liquid at 400. And then we go through the expansion valve, which is constant enthalpy uh, to 180 uh, PSI A, pounds per square inch absolute, which is this ISO bar down on the bottom. So we have <coughs> some vapor, mostly liquid, and then the evaporator takes us over to one, which looks like it's uh, superheated, I'm sorry, saturated vapor, and then we compress up to two, and this is 2S. Uh, let's check the, uh, uh, let's see, let's go back and look at his uh, tables. Uh, let's see. Uh, so let's go, so 180 and 400. So we go up here, this is a uh, one, R134A, this is the pressure table. So at 180, we see, uh, do, 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 do. Okay. so the uh, saturated vapor at 180 is 116.74, and the saturated um, liquid at 400 is this 400 and I think that's saturated liquid I'm pretty sure it is yeah uh 76.11 so we remember those so yeah 11674 so that's where he's looked up those okay so we start the solution you can read all of the engineering model and all that stuff Okay, so the first thing we want to do is determine the enthalpy and then uh, the temperature is B. But so we start out with the enthalpy at the exit of the real compressor, which is two. And so we're given 80% uh, as the isentropic efficiency. And so that's the comparison of the ideal compressor on top to the actual compressor on the bottom. So the ideal compressor is H2S minus H1, and the real compressor is H2 minus H1. So uh, we're gonna, we can find uh, just from the uh, thermodynamic properties, uh, we can find H2S, H1, and uh, then we know this is 0.8, so we can solve for this H2. Uh, unfortunately, we do have to interpolate because we see that we're in superheat. And remember, this is 2 and this is 2S. Those are backwards on their nomenclature. Um, so we look up the entropy at 1 and we go up to this pressure in the superheat tables. And then we can interpolate to find H2S at this point and we use the equation to go over here. So if you go back to the tables, uh, let's see, we want saturated, we're at the high pressure. Uh, so we're 400, no, I'm sorry, we start out at uh, 180. Yeah, and so this is the uh, uh, entropy of the saturated vapor uh, going into the compressor at 180. And so that's the entropy we start at, that's point. 2154, uh, back to the diagram. So we start right here. So the entropy there is 0.2154. So we take that to the superheat tables 
over here at uh, 400. And so we know that pressure and we know that entropy. So then we can interpolate for all of the properties at two. Uh, we can go back and look at that. So let's see, we're going to go to four. Do, 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 do. Uh, if I can find 400 here. There we go. So 400 and what it's 0.2154. So there's 2102 and there's 2235. So we're in between here. So we're between 180 and 200 on temperature. And in terms of enthalpy, we're between uh, 119.93 and 128.6. So you just have to do that interpolation in here. Uh, going back to the solution, I'm not going to do all the math. You get to do that. Okay, and so that enthalpy comes out 123.32. And so that's for the uh, H2S. And then we simply substitute into this rearranged uh, equation that defines the isentropic efficiency. Plugging in the values we have, uh, we get 124.97 for the actual enthalpy H2 right here. Okay. Um, and then we go back and we do a similar interpolation uh, just to solve for temperature instead of enthalpy. Uh, and we get T2 to be uh, 191.63. So those are the two answers to A and B, basically just interpolating uh, in the superheat tables. Okay. Uh, next, uh, <clears throat> we want to find the refrigerant uh, mass flow rate from an energy balance on the control volume around the condenser. And remember, the condenser has to dump, go back up and look at it here. Condenser has to dump 3 million BTUs an hour uh, to the process out of here. So you've got the mass flow rate of refrigerant and times the enthalpy in, the mass flow rate of refrigerant times enthalpy out, and then the heat transfer out. Okay. And so that's basically the, what the energy balance is going to refer to. And so that's what he's saying. Q dot out is the mass flow rate of refrigerant times that enthalpy difference. Or <clears throat> since we know everything but M dot, he's just solving for the mass flow rate. So we got our 3 million BTUs an hour. We've got H2 minus H3 in and out. And you do the math. And you get about, uh, what's that, 61,340 pounds an hour is the refrigerant flow. Okay. Um, the compressor power, go back up, take a look. So we're, I think, ignoring any heat losses from the compressor. So if you assume it's adiabatic, then you've got uh, mass flow rate of refrigerant times enthalpy in mass flow rate times uh, enthalpy refrigerant out and work term. So pretty straightforward. So that's what we see. And we're writing this <clears throat> to be positive, but we know the work's going into the compressor. So there's our mass flow rate, 61,000. Uh, 340 pounds an hour times the enthalpy difference across the compressor. So what is that? That's 5.048 times 10 to the fifth BTUs an hour. Okay. <clears throat> so then we want to calculate our coefficient of performance. And that's the, uh, the desired output, which is Q down out, the heat transfer rate out divided by the work rate in. So it's just the ratio of this 3 million to the compressor work. And that comes out 5.95. So that's our coefficient of performance for the heat pump. And then we calculate the uh, Carnot. Said, so go ahead and do that. Compare it to the ideal unit. 
And so our low temperature is uh, 125 Fahrenheit. That's the wastewater temperature. Yeah, so translate that. You got to do the Carnot and Rankin. So that's what, 584.67 Rankin and TH is 170. That's where we're depositing the heat. Uh, and in Rankin, that's uh, what, 629.67. And then the Carnot uh, heat pump efficiency is TH over TH minus TC. Plug in the numbers, we get 13.99, almost 14. Uh, and then he's got a note down here, uh, coefficient performance for the Carnot heat pump cycle operating at reservoir temperatures is higher than that of the original vapor compression cycle. <clears throat> uh, referring to the TS diagram, we see that the evaporator temperature is lower than TC and the condenser temperature is higher than TH. We have to do that to have finite heat exchangers in size by operating at evaporator and the condenser at these temperatures. Um, there would be irreversibility associated with heat transfer between the working fluid passing through each heat exchanger and the respective reservoir. So those irreversibilities within the vapor compression heat pump cycle further reduce the coefficient of performance compared to Carnot. So that's one reason. And then you would have friction and other things going on. Uh, well, of course, we don't have friction in this solution, uh, but we do have the irreversibility of the compressor comes into play as well. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Okay, um, I think we're going to skip um, problem 1036. It's pretty similar to 1033, the one we just went over. So I'm going to move on to 1044. Uh, this is a Brayton uh, refrigeration cycle, which is an all air or gas based uh, system that uses a compressor and a turbine by expanding a high pressure uh, gas through a turbine, we can drop to really low temperatures. And then we just use that uh, air or whatever the gas is uh, at low temperature, heat it back up for the refrigeration effect. So consider a Brayton refrigeration cycle with a regenerative heat exchanger. And uh, that heat exchanger just moves some heat around in the cycle to make it a little bit more efficient. Uh, air enters the compressor at uh, 500 degrees Rankin. So what is that? That's about 40, about 39 and some change Fahrenheit. Uh, 16 uh, pounds force per inch squared, that would be absolute. So just a little bit higher than atmospheric um, is compressed isentropically. So we got an isentropic compressor. That's nice uh, to 45 uh, PSI. A <clears throat> compressed air enters the regenerative heat exchanger at 550 and is cooled to 490 Rankin before entering the turbine. Expansion through the turbine is isentropic. So that's nice. Uh, if the refrigeration capacity is 14 tons, calculate the volumetric uh, flow rate at the compressor inlet in cubic feet per minute and the coefficient of performance. Okay, so let's take a look at the cycle. And this one, uh, they did not put any arrows on this. So I guess, you know, we're, we're big boys and girls, we can figure it out, but at any rate, I, I would have put arrows. Anyway, uh, one is the inlet to the compressor, 500 Fahrenheit, uh, Rankin, and 16 uh, PSIA, and so that's over here, one, on the TS diagram. Let's say, you know, there's no phase change going on here, so this is all just gas or vapor. Uh, <clears throat> so that's in at low pressure, comes out at high pressure, so we come out at two and we're going straight up on the entropy scale since we're isentropic to two. And that's uh, 45 uh, pounds force per inch squared absolute. So that's this, this is a isobar. And so states uh, two, A and three are all at this high pressure of 45. 
states four, B, and one are all at the lower pressure 16. Okay. So we're, uh, you know, we're wanting to cool this gas down in the turbine. And so it's pretty hot coming out of the compressor. So we have a heat exchanger where we're just throwing away some heat to the atmosphere, getting it as cold as we can, probably an air-cooled condenser. Could be water cooled, it could be a cooling tower, but whatever. We're rejecting heat Q dot out in this device. And so uh, let's see, we're at high pressure too. And so well, we have to determine, uh, we're not given this temperature, but you can see it's considerably higher than 550. We are given the temperature at A where we come out of uh, this first uh, heat exchanger dump into atmosphere. So we're at 550 a day, and then we come through this where we're trying to uh, pre-cool it with this regenerative heat exchanger. And so we can drop it to 490, which gets us down to three. And then we expand through the turbine isentropically where we drop pressure and we get uh, really cold at four. And then this is the refrigeration effect from four uh, through this device that we're, we're it, this is the heat exchanger. We're pulling, we're pulling 14 tons of heat uh, out of something over here into the heat exchanger. If it's just air conditioning or whatever we're, we're cooling with it, it's 14 tons. And so that gets us uh, from four to B and then so it's still pretty cold and so we're gonna we're gonna heat this up and we're gonna cool this stream down um this is the one that's going what from a to three so we're gonna take this guy from here to here while we take this uh still relatively cold stream that has already done the cooling from uh b to one so it's going to go up from this point b up to 500 and this one's going to go <clears throat> down from, um, let's see, from A, which is 550 to 490. Okay. Um, so I think that's pretty much around the cycle. Uh, engineering model, you know, control volume, steady state, isentropic uh, compressor and turbine. No pressure drops through heat exchangers, throwing away kinetic potential energy, working fluids model as an ideal gas, as air, which is nice. Um, and no, there's no heat transfer from the regenerative heat exchanger to the surroundings. So this is well a well insulated device. Okay, so we're gonna use table A22E for our properties. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is find the properties. Okay, and so let's pull up, uh, so we're 500 degrees Rankin. Uh, we can pull up A22E, so 500 degrees Rankin. Uh, yeah, these are, this is Rankin, so 500. Uh, the enthalpy is 119.48. So we can go back, 119.48. Oh, and this, so. Uh, uh, relative pressure that and we can use this relative for these relative pressure terms for isentropic directly. So uh, this is this is really nice and you'll see this in just a second. So we also want to know PR1 and that's at 500. So PR1 is 1.059. And so we know 1.059. So that looks like that was done correctly. Okay, so state two is the uh, compression process. And so we can use this relationship that uh, PR2 divided by PR1 is equal to the pressure ratio. Okay, so then we just multiply across by PR1, and this gives us a way to find PR2. And again, this is isentropic uh, compression. And so we plug in PR1, we plug in our pressures, and we get, then we know that PR2 is 2.9784, 2.9784. Uh, 
2.97. Okay, so we're someplace in here, right? 2.8, 2.9, 2.7, 2.6, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, 2.8, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 2.9, 
is the high number coming out and is, is more energetic minus H1 going or H4 going in. So that would be, if you want to write that as a positive, uh, so it'd be HB minus H4 times the mass flow rate <coughs> has to equal 14 tons. There we go. So HB minus H4, 14 tons. Uh, convert the tons to the BTUs per minute per ton. Divide by the enthalpy difference, and we get 154.7 uh, pounds mass per minute because the BTUs cancel, the pounds flip up, and then the minutes come down. And there you go. Um, so that's the mass flow rate, and then we just use it. This AV, remember, A is cross sectional area, which is like square feet. And uh, V1 is average velocity, which is feet per second. So that's cubic feet per second. Or it could be or cubic feet per minute, you know, whatever your time base is on, on your velocity. So that, that would be feet per minute, I guess, in this case. Uh, and so um, we can use the uh, ideal gas law, uh, PV is equal to m dot rt and uh, solve for that volumetric flow rate uh, it's all we've done from the standard ideal gas law is just put a mass flow rate instead of a mass flow amount in there so you can do that and it you pick up the units of minutes in uh, the final answer, uh, cubic feet per minute. So we put the mass flow rate in uh, 154.7 pounds mass per minute. And then this is just the specific gas constant, uh, universal divided by molecular weight of air, and then the temperature uh, at the inlet is 500 degrees R. Here's the pressure. And don't forget, we got to get our inches out of it. So we got to have our 144 inches squared per foot squared and make the units work. And then we get uh, 1790 uh, cubic feet per minute. Uh, coefficient of performance for this Brayton unit is the uh, refrigeration effect. This is all per unit mass, which is HB, HB minus H4. And then the turbine work. Um, we have to expand the compressor. We have to put work into the compressor. We get a little bit of work out of the turbine. And so we have to take both of those into consideration. So this is the compressor work required, written as a positive quantity, H2 minus H1. And we're going to subtract off the work we got out of the turbine, which is H3 minus H4. That's what's written to be positive. And then we subtract that off. And we get 1.63 for the coefficient of performance. So there you go on problem 1044. All right, moving on to problem 1045, which is a continuation really of 1044. Uh, it's essentially the same problem, but now we're gonna include isentropic efficiencies uh, for the compressor and turbine at 84%. Uh, answer the same questions as in the previous problem and determine the rate of entropy production within the compressor and turbine each in BTUs per minute per degree ranking. So we had all that previous information but that we'll bring over. And so this is the uh, modified uh, cycle diagram. So now on the compressor, instead of going to 2S, we're going to extend up to 2 because it's not isentropic anymore. And on the turbine, instead of coming straight down to 4S, we're going to bend over to 4 because there's some entropy production in the turbine. And of course, this is going to degrade the performance of the cycle a little bit. And so we want to go through these calculations. So this is a good pair of problems, 44 and 45. Uh, similar. So here's the, uh, the information that we developed previously 
for all of the different enthalpies in the cycle. So we're going to have to go back and uh, modify, and we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to find um, you know this two and this four, and you know potentially modify uh, all of the solution to take into consideration these isentropic deficiencies. So. Um, State one didn't change. And notice we're going to look up these uh, uh, S uh, superscript zeros because we'll need that for the entropy production calculation. So we're going to go ahead and note those as we go through. <clears throat> okay, so state two, now this involves the compressor. And so now we have to use the expression for the isentropic efficiency to uh, determine what H2 is instead of just using H2S. So, I mean, it's, you just use this expression. We know everything in here but H2. So, you solve it for H2. You plug in all of your numbers and that we had previously, and we get uh, 168.52. So, that's now the uh, enthalpy coming out of the compressor instead of uh, H2S, which was 160.67. Okay, uh, and we want the S uh, superscript zero uh, at two, and you have to interpolate with this enthalpy uh, in your tables, and that comes out 0.66546 BTUs per pound minutes per degree, right? Okay. Uh, T3 is still 490, and they're just looking up the uh, S superscript zero at 0.57744. And then for the turbine, uh, it's no longer an isentropic turbine. So we know the uh, isentropic efficiency at four. Uh, the exit for the isentropic turbine we brought over. So we just solve this expression for H4, plug in all of our knowns. And we get 91.82 uh, instead of the isentropic value was, I guess, 87.01. Okay. And then we want to take this enthalpy and uh, into the table and determine the S superscript zero at four, uh, which is 0.51938. Okay. So not too bad. Now we're just reworking. It's going to change the numbers some. Uh, so we still have our 14 tons. And for our mass flow of refrigerant, it's still <clears throat> HB over H4. That's the refrigeration effect that we had before unit conversion. So now we get 210.7 um, pounds mass per minute. So that's up. Uh, did we bring over that number? I didn't bring it over. I forget. I closed that problem. <clears throat> but it gets up a little bit from uh, 1044. Uh, biometric flow rate, it's the same using the ideal gas law. We just plug in the, the different mass flow rate in pounds per minute. Everything else is <clears throat> the same. And now we're 2438.6 cubic feet per minute. The coefficient of performance is uh, the same definition. It's the refrigeration effect, uh, which was HB minus H4. Uh, H1 minus H2 is the compressor. Work input is a positive, minus the turbine work output as a positive. Plug it in the revised numbers. Now we were uh, well over one before, and now we're 0.56. Okay, and then the uh, entropy production within the compressor. Uh, it's the production is the mass flow rate uh, through the compressor times uh, S2 minus S1 minus uh, if there was any heat transfer from the compressor, but we're assuming it's adiabatic, so there is no heat transfer term. It's set equal to zero. And so to get this S2 minus S1, it's S superscript 0, 2 minus S superscript 0, 1 minus 
r the gas con the specific gas constant times the log of the pressures uh, back from our well, chapter six i think um so uh doing the arithmetic on this we get uh, 2.39 btus per minute per degree right uh, and then the entropy production for the turbine it's the same calculation we're just using state points uh, four and three <clears throat> so the production for the turbine is m dot uh, <clears throat> times s4 minus s3 again the turbine is well insulated so we don't have any heat transfer from it so the heat transfer <clears throat> term for entropy production is thrown away set to zero and then our s4 minus s3 is s superscript 4 minus s superscript 3 minus log of and minus r specific gas constant times the pressure the log of the pressure ratio so this comes out to be 2.7 BTUs per minute per degree rank. So comments, note the, volu the volumetric uh, flow rate is higher and the coefficient of performance is lower than in the previous 1044 due to irreversibilities in the compressor and turbine. Isentropic efficiency of compressor and turbine are equivalent <clears throat> and uh, the corresponding entropy production rates differ by about 15%. Okay, very good. We'll move on to 49 here, which is the last problem. Okay, class, the last uh, homework problem of the semester. There we go. Air undergoes an Erickson refrigeration cycle. Now, in chapter nine, which we what you do in thermal two, you talk about the Erickson power cycle. And so <laughs> this is the reverse of the Erickson power cycle, it's a refrigeration cycle. This is a, a theoretical value only. I'm not aware that this can actually be implemented anywhere. It's, it'd be very difficult to actually accomplish these processes as we'll see. But uh, we have a figure and it provides data for the cycle operating at steady state. We want to sketch on a PV diagram uh, the cycle and determine the heat transfer for the isothermal expansion that's in the turbine uh, per unit mass of airflow. So we've got air going, <clears throat> which is nice. Uh, the network uh, per unit mass of airflow. Uh, in kilojoules per kilogram. So we got a compressor and a turbine going on and then the uh, coefficient of performance. <clears throat> so what this guy does is, let's say we take air coming in at some condition, but we'll see. And we're going to compress it in the compressor, but we're gonna reject heat from it as we compress it. And so we're gonna assume that this could be an isothermal constant temperature compression. Now, in reality, you can't do that. You know, I don't think there's any devices that can actually accomplish that. So this is more of theoretical interest. <clears throat> but anyway, so this is, uh, this is hot. Uh, well, it's constant temperature, but anyway, it's coming out. And we're going we're gonna to cool it down. We're going to pre-cool it in the turbine to get more uh, in the uh, ideal regenerator put colder air into the turbine to get colder air out of the turbine to get more refrigeration effect. Okay, so we <clears throat> come out of the compressor, which this process occurs at constant temperature. Then we cool it down through the regenerator and then we expand it through the turbine. Well, we're gonna do this expansion at constant temperature as well. So from three to four be the same temperature. <clears throat> uh, and in order to do that then we have to transfer heat in because if we don't this gas will be colder at four than it will be at three and so the only way we can do it isothermally <clears throat> is to transfer heat into the turbine while the expansion is going on and again you can't do that in reality uh, at any rate so we come out at the same temperature and we go into the ideal regenerator <clears throat> which then uh, heats us up to the temperature that the compressor operates at. 
So it's a little bit of a squirrely cycle. If you want to know the truth in terms of being able to implement it, but that doesn't mean we can't apply the, law, the laws of thermodynamics to it. So here's our state points. Uh, one and two, the compressor, well, let's see, one, uh, the compressor on the low side, it's 100 kPa and it's 310. And on the high side, it's 350 kPa and it's still at 310 because that occurs uh, isothermally. And then uh, from uh, two to three, let's see, we're going to drop temperature. Uh, we have no pressure drop through the ide ideal regenerator, but we're going to uh, drop temperature by what, 40 degrees Kelvin, I guess, these are degrees K. And then uh, we drop pressure in the turbine, but we do it at constant temperature, and that pulls heat into the turbine, which is the refrigeration effect. So this is the uh, refrigeration effect, and this is the dumping of heat you know, to the environment over here. Okay. Um, so anyway, just repeating what we already know. We got air as a working fluid, and kinetic potential energy is gone. Uh, compression expansion process is isothermal. All processes in turn are reversible, so it's an ideal cycle. Each component's analyzed so as control volume and steady state. Okay, so here's our diagram. <clears throat> so here's our uh, compressor. Goes from the, so this is a PV diagram. So it goes from a, uh, and this is uh, a isotherm line of constant temperature. And so we're at the low pressure and high specific volume. We're going to compress at constant temperature up to the high pressure, lower specific volume. Then we're going to go through the regenerator where we're going to cool it from 310 down to 270. And then we're going to expand through the turbine isothermally. So all that's at uh, 270 K. We get down here at the bottom and then we're going to heat it up again in the regenerator uh, from 270 to 310 to get us from four to one. Okay, and that's all that, that's a constant pressure. So both sides of the regenerator operate at constant pressure, even though they're different pressures. One strain appears at 350 and this one's at 100 kPa. Okay, so if we write an energy balance for the control volume around the turbine, which is right here, what do we have? Well, we have work coming out, we have heat going in, we got a mass flow, the same mass flow uh, in at three and out at four. So going back, uh, DECVDT is zero, Q dot N minus work dot turbine. Uh, plus M dot times delta H, those three have to add to zero. Uh, and we know that the temperature T3 is equal to T4. So for this ideal gas, uh, the enthalpy H3 is equal to H4. So this term jumps out and we see that the uh, rate of heat transfer in per unit mass is equal to the rate of uh, work generation, <coughs> W dot turbine per unit mass. Okay. Um, so then for an internally reversible process at steady state, uh, for one inlet, one exit control volume, the work per unit mass flowing, <coughs> this is, uh, the, we developed this previously, it's the negative of the integral uh, across that device from three to four in terms of our state points specific volume times VP. And then we can use the ideal gas since we know that PV uh, is equal to RT. And so that makes V equal to RT over P. And so we substitute uh, RT over P <clears throat> here. And R is universal over M and T, so that is constant, so that pulls through the integral sign. And we wind up with dP over P, which integrates into the log of P4 over P3. 
<clears throat> and the minus sign then you can take in to the log term and just flip them. So we, instead of writing it minus log of P4 over P3, we take the minus sign <clears throat> and write it log of P3 over P4. And we plug our numbers in. We've got all of this <clears throat> and we get uh, uh, the, the heat transfer effect or the work effect is 95.07 kilojoules per kilogram. So that's the answer to A. Uh, let's see. So for uh, net work of the cycle, first find the compressor work. So it's the same thing. Uh, it's the same equation. We simply are going from low pressure to a high pressure. So we rewrite this in terms of state one to state two. And we get uh, universal gas constant over molecular weight times T1 log of P2 over P1. Plug it in. <clears throat> we get the compressor work is uh, 111.45. And so therefore, the uh, net work of the cycle is what the compressor requires minus what the turbine generates. So let's say the turbine got us, what was it, 95, and the compressor requires 111, so the difference is about 14.38. So that's the net work of the cycle. And then the coefficient of performance is the refrigeration effect, uh, Q dot N, and you know what? There's a typo. I thought there was. Let's see, this is 95.07. And that's just a typo. That should be 95.07. Uh, I didn't check the math, but yeah, 9507 divided by 14.38 would be the correct uh, coefficient of performance. So uh, they got a typo right there. Okay. All right, team. Uh, I'll be posting this shortly uh, along with. Uh, the exam time, which I told you on this, and so um, uh, we'll be you'll be taking that exam this coming Monday from ten thirty till twelve thirty uh, after lunch. So I hope everybody does well, and you've had a great semester. I've enjoyed it, and uh, uh, we'll get this thing wrapped up here pretty quick. <clears throat>